Thanks. Um, yeah, so natural shorelines might be a natural extension of this concept. Um, there's been a lot of interest in Lake Lansing with the blue green algae and kind of we're talking a little bit about what we might do to draw some attention to some of the stuff we've been talking about for a year, building back the better buffers. Yeah, it might be kind of <clears throat> might be kind of nice to do a, a project there and you know install some signage. I think am I remembering correctly that there is signage at some portions of Lake Lansing? Or am I am I confusing that with another park? <laughs> I think that there is, uh, I think there is some signage at the, the buffer or the bioswale by the Lake Lansing Park South, okay. is it? That might be what I'm thinking of then. But I'm not sure, I haven't I seen the, it. The trails there have some signage, but it's pretty poor and a lot of it's missing. And one of the biggest problems is it doesn't locate where like, like you are here on the map. Uh, so it's difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, well, Leroy, the bio trail at Lake Lansing South, where, where in the park is it kind of located? If you're looking towards the lake, it's off to the right. Apparently okay. it's, you know, it's, uh, it's just one example of green infrastructure. Um, and I'm not sure it's in the ideal location. I don't know exactly why. Um, so is that the cattail area where all those cattails is are? Not that far, but oh, there may be okay. there may be some cattails in there. But okay, there was talk about doing it um, maybe on the Lake Lansing Park North. There's a couple of residents who are interested, but. And talking to Giannis, um, there was a uh, that would be more more complicated because it's a county owned facility. It's not impossible, but ideally we should have this all around the lake. Um, but he did mention a spot that Meridian Township owns where they installed a seawall about 15 years ago, and that was sort of a quick fix uh, before sort of the natural shorelines concept was um, mainstream. So there might be a possibility, for example, to create an example where you're converting a seawall to a natural shoreline in this spot. And then maybe there's other demonstration areas as well. Hey, Leroy, yeah. is, is natural shorelines uh, a nonprofit or what's their, who are they? The Michigan Natural Shoreline Partnership is essentially like a partnership made up of a variety of organizations. So. Um, MSU Extension is a partner, um, the Michigan and the Lakes Partnership, um, Eagle, so the current actual coordinator of the Michigan National Shoreline Partnership is with Eagle, um, Julia Kirkwood, she's I think in the Nonpoint Source Division, um, contractors, um, just kind of a variety of organizations, um, really in their, their mission is to, you know, increase education of natural shorelines and the value of them to inland lakes. Um, and then to also, of course, provide educational services. Um, and so the, that partnership does a few things. So they do contractor training, so they like approve landscapers um, who install seawalls um, to also know how to install shorelines that are natural. So there's lots of engineering, right, that goes into that, that side of things. Um, we found, you know, through research that people you know, you might call someone up and say, hey, I want to replace my seawall. And it's really ideal if that person can also say, well, there's this other option. Um, and so that's kind of the, you know, one avenue of increasing natural shorelines in Michigan is that contractor training. And then the other thing they do is they do lots of um, education for homeowners. Um, they haven't hosted a homeowner training in a while. Um, I'm, I think I'm technically like a certified natural shoreline educator. Um, they used to have like an educator certification program, um, but they, you know, produce materials and outreach pieces that can be, you know, distributed to homeowners. Um, and then we are very slowly <laughs> due to COVID trying to develop an online kind of class about shorelines for residents, but um, that's definitely on the back burner currently. So it's kind of like, um, a partnership of organizations and their aim is to, you know, increase education. 
Um, one of their initiatives a few years ago, they have an online certification program where you can like grade your shoreline. So say that you lived on like Lansing or wherever, you can take this kind of online quiz and answer questions about your property, like where your water goes, you know, kind of what you do, like, do you pick up your dog poop? Do you, you know, leave leaves? Um, and then they kind of give you a score. It says like, okay, this is kind of where we'd put your shoreline. Um, and then you can get a sign that goes in your yard to say like, I'm gold, like I have the best shoreline or, you know, here's some tips to, you know, improve your property. Um, so that's another kind of popular thing in other states um, that Michigan's trying to adopt is like having research has shown that like if you say you have a natural shoreline and your landscape is very beautiful, your neighbors are going to look to you and say like, oh, like that's kind of cool and it's working. And so the shoreline partnership also has done installations of shorelines in public spaces to like, you know, increase knowledge about them. So that's a really long winded answer. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that was very helpful. And, you know, you, you, since we've been talking about Lake Lansing, uh, you know, I could imagine a number of the owners there who have shorelines would be interested, they'd be kind of curious, you know, about, oh, I can kind of score my shoreline. I wonder what that means and how I would score. I, I would, I don't know, uh, you know, the best re way to reach out to those folks. But I would guess that would really uh, help increase the education of uh, people who are on Lake Lansing, uh, you know, who, who are on the shoreline. Just because, again, I think, you know, you kind of go, oh, I wonder how well I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, and actually the, I, the program is actually called Score the Shore, and I can put it in okay. the chat. But yeah, yeah, something like that is, it's kind of interesting, right? Like it's a way to you know, for you to kind of personally know how you're doing and then right. to also get acknowledgement if you're doing a really great job. You know, we found, you know, providing people signs is like a really big incentive to them doing things. You know, people want to be, some people, you know, want to be gold. So um, yeah, it's really, it's really fun, I think. Well, and it's also a way, I mean, uh, so many people I hear talk about, you know, oh, we've got geese constantly. How do we figure out how to get the geese, whatever? And, you know, you go to a lake anywhere and people have the strings across or they whatever, because most people don't have buffers. I mean, you could in that and all of that, you teach them how to handle or, or what ways work for handling problems like that. So. Yeah. Uh, or the coyotes. I love, I have friends that live on Houghton Lake and like every single house has, you know, that fake plastic coyote and they're all in the same stance and you see like the geese like circling. <laughs> You're like, oh, I love it. It's not I love it. Yeah, the coyote, I think the fake coyote is my favorite of the geese deterrents. So that actually works? <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, I feel like maybe if you like moved it every day right. you know, and, and you like, he had a, like a different stance, maybe. Right. I think right. that's and kind of like. Make him you know. animatronic. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> hey, there's a market there for a, uh, some business person. <laughs> we, should, we should talk to the robotics club at Haslett High School. Mm -hmm. Ooh, what a project that would be. They could actually make tons of money for it from it. Yeah. <laughs> So I just dropped a link in the chat for uh, the Cooperative Lake Monitoring Program. And it, it sounds like it has um, a lot of affinity with the things that Paige was talking about. It's kind of more starts from the focus on the water quality monitoring, but also looks at invasives, including on the shoreline, whereas the shoreline program is about the shoreline and maybe looking out. I uh, created an account on the, the site uh, yesterday and um, they have uh, I, uh, many dozens of lakes in Michigan that are um, participating in, in sort of citizen science water quality monitoring, um, water clarity, dissolved oxygen, phosphorus, and you know some of the key water quality concerns. <clears throat> uh, and I just now got a, a, a reply from the um, uh, MSU coordinator of that program, Joe Lattimore, um, who. Uh, I've been told that they, they try to stick to bigger lakes and they, it, she's saying that they do in fact try to stick to uh, lakes five, uh, 
five acres or larger. Um, <clears throat> and when I looked in the list yesterday, I didn't see any lakes in Ingham County, including Lake Lansing, as participating in, in the program. Um, so it seems like, and basically what they do is they, they have a protocol, they train you in how to use it, and then they uh, basically provide the equipment uh, <clears throat> for doing all this testing. And then you upload your results into a, a, a statewide database and you can track them over time and things. So um, our pond here in, in Tacoma Hills, I think is just three acres. So it, it's too small to qualify, but um, if somebody wanted to get Lake Lansing kind of going down that path, and I know there's plenty of MSU professors who take classes out there and collect water samples and try to make them available to the uh, association. But as far as I know, it's not all that systematic. Yeah, MyCore is a, a really great program. Um, there's also like a MyCore training where you can like learn more about MyCore, so the stream side and the lake side. And that's really soon, if I if I'm remembering correctly. So Joel Admore was my academic advisor um, in college. So, um, but yeah, something like that would be great for Lake Lansing. I agree. I've went and looked at the, the link that you just shared, Bill, and it, it had a picture of a woman raking some sort of aquatic plant out. And I just wanna say I raked the duckweed out and then picked it up and it's not fun. I don't know that I will bother to do that again because I don't know that it was helpful nor oh it's so heavy it was so yeah. heavy. i i think in that instance what they were trying to illustrate is um trying to get a sample so you could identify it rather yeah. than trying to go and you know physically haul yeah it. and so there's like um there's a few like different monitoring programs so one of them is you actually can map all of the aquatic plants in your lake so you would throw they're like makeshift rakes right so you'd throw rakes out i think it's like so at three intervals from the shoreline. Um, and we would teach you how to identify all the aquatic plants. Believe it or not, there's lots of diversity under there in Lake Lansing. So I've done aquatic plant sampling in Lake Lansing. And then you would essentially kind of like have a map and know where all the aquatic plants are. And then there's the exotic aquatic plant watch, which is just for invasive species. So a little less rigorous regarding the sampling method. Um, and it would just be for, you know, aquatic plants that we're concerned about. So it's kind of variable, um, but yeah, it's, it, 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 it can be a little messy. It's definitely something to do on a boat that you don't particularly care too much about regarding getting messy. But yeah, I think aquatic plant sampling is actually very fun. So if any of you ever wanna go out, I'm, I'm always game. Well, it sounds like it might really fit nicely with our wetland education uh, campaign, just because there's so many different angles to involvement, and obviously we're we're all in the same watershed, or most of us are in the same watershed. Um, and then Lake Lansing, of course, is our pride and joy here in Meridian. So I'm excited about the possibilities and the $10,000 is a nice chunk of change, but I'm sure that there would be other funding. And if, if they actually help with restoration on public, if the Shoreline Partnership actually helps with restoration on a public spot, um, that might be a really cool way to do it. Um, and maybe not even have to use our green infrastructure funds for that or use matching funds or whatever. I did I'm, notice that um, the lake called Wildlife Lake uh, that's uh, behind Hazlitt uh, High School, uh, what did show up in the, the pick list for the MICOR uh, monitoring program. I guess it is big enough. So if somebody was interested uh, at the high school to uh, start doing monitoring out their back door, that might be something worth it. Uh, I just discovered that lake during COVID. It's a pretty cool little spot. Yeah, I think, you know, it seems like regarding the volunteers that I meet through my core, you know, it's really about having that resident or a few neighbors that are really kind of invested in and sampling and going out, you know, if it's going to be succubus, which is water clarity or phosphorus sampling, you know, it's 
it really helps to kind of have that local buy-in. There's some lakes in, in my core um, that have, um, that have, you know, perhaps are, it's coordinated by maybe a conservation district and they maybe go out and sample a variety of lakes. Um, but, you know, of course it's better to have a, a local group do it if possible. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways to think about it, but. Yana yeah, said the Lake Lansing Advisory Group has approached the Michigan Shoreline Partnership for the uh, last couple of years without success. I'm not sure why that hasn't been successful yet, but um, but maybe it has been that that uh, local involvement piece. I don't know. Uh, he's he sits on the Lake Lansing Advisory Committee. Anyway, these are two separate projects, but um, potentially related. Good morning, Kendra. Good morning. I spoke with um, Kurt, the Lake Lansing Advisory um, Chair, I guess, or leader. Um, and I know that they're doing some swales and um, different kinds of things. So they're doing some projects too. So I think we can partner well, certainly on all of this. It's all, of wa all about watersheds. So. so I think it'd be helpful to hear what they're doing specifically and how what's working and, and what's missing. Definitely, yeah, that's encouraging. Um, Giannis, How do you get to the wildlife lake? How do you get there? Is it, do you go to it from the back of Hazlitt or high school? Okay. By the football field, there's a couple of trails that lead back there behind the football field. Uh, you can see it on a Google map. And uh, it's just a really interesting little spot. One thing, um, I guess, thanks to the food group conversation, we've got a new food um, committee, food to compost, kind of closing the loop and looking at our food system and, and uh, organic waste in our community. I have not been involved with it, but someone shared a mind map, um, a mind mapping tool, which uh, some of you might enjoy. And some of you may have used it, but this one's, I think it's called mindmeister.com. So I just I started uh, one on this natural shoreline demonstration. And it's really easy to just add, add uh, links. So, uh, and sublinks. If you know how to type, it makes it easier too, which I've found. But um, anyway, um, I just wanted to mention that if you're interested in mind mapping, I thought, um, Sarah, one of the first things we did over a year and a half ago was Sarah was working on creating a mind map of sort of environmental initiatives in our region. And it might be fun to go back to that. Or maybe you're tired of mind maps, Sarah, by now. But, but using this tool, I think I found it to be one of the simplest ones, and it's free. So just a little. I'm excited that uh, Paige also has sort of... Um, helped introduce us to some of this natural shoreline fact sheets and is, is a certified trainer. I mean, that is, a lot of this stuff might come together really cool, really nicely. Yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunities to do something at a public space. You know, I think, I mean, I think the biggest barrier is always cost, but um, bringing things together would be, It'd be really nice and there are some definite assets to lake lansing the, another thing to think about is lots of professionals that work for the state also happen to live in our area um so actually just through uh the agenda for the my Corps conference in the chat um one of the keynote speakers is joe noner he's a really great uh, limnologist and he happens to also live on lake lansing he just moved there recently so um i just think there's lots of lots of assets and people who would be supportive of something like that. 
on Lake Lansing or in the area. So I, I agree, Paige, and it's something that we're we're working on. Certainly with the wetland outreach group, we're looking at different demonstration areas all around the the township. So the more yeah. people we can get educated about, you know, what our what our initiatives are. Um, people that are willing to volunteer and be part of that, um, the more spots, the more places we can have eyes would be helpful because it's, you know, that is all about the watershed. And yeah, right. And and how great to do like a wetland demonstration and a shoreline demonstration, you know, and, and that sort of thing and increase signage and just kind of awareness of those projects. I think it's helpful just to see things, right, you know, to experience them. So... Right, yeah. I mean, it's part of this like build back the buffer, and it doesn't necessarily be wetlands, it can be lakes, it can be ditches, mm -hmm. you know, like all of that kind of stuff. And even watching the stuff with the Daniels, you know, drain project last night, you know, um, what you have on your property matters, you know, like deep rooted system matters. Um, so I think we can gauge the community in a different kind of way um, with all of these issues, particularly with all the flooding that we've experienced. Yeah, I think you um, attended one of the sessions for the uh, Conservation Stewards Program. Yeah, I thought I saw your name because I was sorting everyone. But um, so that was a program that Extension did um, that was kind of in-depth. It was 10 weeks long on a variety of, of things. But the, the people that we had for kind of representing the mid-Michigan region, um, we pulled them, you know, about their interests. And every single person, I think, said flooding and green infrastructure and water quality and it was definitely um a very prominent topic um of residents in mid michigan at least in that program so one i guess upside of people's basements flooding <laughs> one of the um goals i think is to reach um quote average citizens if there is such a thing you know you might not have a pond in your backyard, you might not even have a wetland on your property, but like for example, uh, what what can what can somebody do in their yard? And there's lots of things everyone can do, but <clears throat> anyway, the idea is like what what which of the things that we are suggesting? First of all, what are we suggesting that people consider? And then what's practical? For someone that might have been you know, neatly mowing their lawn for the last 30 years and what are the baby steps someone can take i like that idea of a quiz because that's something we can all take a quiz yeah it was interestingly um at the green fair uh we had a booth i shared a booth with our horticulture educator um so she's based out of the ingham county office with me for msu extension and uh, we had, she she had some materials on like lawn care and pollinators. Um, and then I had materials on like invasive species and water quality. Um, and we had quite a few people come up to us and just ask us for like turf fact sheets. They were like, I want a really green lawn. How can I have a really green lawn? And it was just, it was kind of interesting. We probably had a 50-50. We had half the people were talking to us about their lawn and how they wanted that like lush grass I guess and then the other half were like how can I put native plants and clover in my lawn so I don't have to mow it but it was kind of it was kind of an interesting mixture of of people for sure I was a little surprised at how many people wanted grass fact sheets I, I will admit <laughs> I think that's really about the education piece and what um, people think is um, what they're supposed to do, right? And, and you know, you have companies going around saying to them, hey, this is what you need for your yard. And this is what, you know, the people in your neighborhood do kind of thing. So I think it's really educating people differently about how to, how to do things differently. And if they understood, like, I don't, again, I'll say this, I say this many times, does anyone hate butterflies, right? Like, does anyone hate having butterflies in their yard? I, I don't know that there's anyone that does. So if you can put it in those kind of terms, like, hey, if you want, you know, pollinators and this is what you might appreciate, um, that kind of thing, people are gonna be buying plants for their yards anyways, for the most part, I think. I mean, there probably are some people, I don't know what the percentage is, they just want only lawn, no plants or whatever. But um, some degree of people are gonna be buying some sort of plant. So how do we kind of help 
them, you know, if you're going to be doing it anyways, what would be environmentally friendly? How do we get them in the, maybe just those, those smaller ways to start out with? I think part of it is also just sort of recognizing the signage that uh, Paige was talking about. You know, this is a natural lawn or this is a natural shoreline. This is a buffer zone, whatever. But yeah, we're I'm kind of like, we're still formulating our vision for what makes sense for our wetland education outreach. So we, we also have some funding for that um, this coming year. So we potentially could produce some signage or um, <clears throat> if we're doing a demonstration project on a public space, we potentially could use some of those funds and maybe leverage additional funding. I was talking with our treasurer yesterday and um, he was saying he really enjoyed that um, tree planting initiative that we did <clears throat> at the middle school and wants to do that again. And, um, you know, he was saying that a lot of the environmental projects that we've been doing are really some of the feel good stuff that the township has been involved with over the past couple of years. So um, that was encouraging. Although I don't necessarily want to help organize another 40 large tree planting, but if anybody wants to step up to the plate, Anywho. Well, I wonder if working with Lamprez can help with that too, because I mean, we're working in the preserves doing that kind of thing too. I think maybe pulling, you know, and Lamprez wants to meet with anyways with the environmental commission anyway. So I think we can put people's minds together and uh, sort that out. Oh, I like that. Thanks for mentioning that. Because Emma has always been such a great helper. She was super helpful for the neighborhood cleanup we, we recently did. And neighborhood cleanups might be a, a cool foot in the door, so to speak, with neighborhoods like Central Park Estates, for example, where we worked, where everybody wants that lush green lawn and they also don't like litter. So we're, you know, there may be some opportunities to, to meet with neighborhoods and it's in the guise of a, a neighborhood cleanup. And we're also talking about, you know, here's some things that we don't want to step on or you know, this is why we're cleaning up this drainage ditch, things like that. I think the good dem the demonstrations, like every other week, um, you know, we have the, the work days on Saturdays. I've been involved in planting lots of native seeds and plants. Um, you know, there's the removal of the invasives too, but like, but I, I really particularly enjoy planting the natives too. Um, and so I think getting people involved and seeing what that kind of looks like too in different kinds of ways. And, you know, Emma does a really great job and has that, you know, edu and Steve Thomas, who, you know, leads in, they do a great job of having that educational piece. And I have to just say, like, I love all of this stuff, right? But my husband and I were just talking earlier today in our walk, like how much we have learned just in the last year um, about, identifying plants, all this different kind of stuff. And we love this stuff, right? And we've learned so many things. So how do you, you know, I just think that speaks a lot to the great work that Emma does, Steve does, Leroy does, all of you and learning from all of you. Um, you know, like there's that educational piece that goes along with it. And then like the hands-on piece that makes a difference. And then the visual piece too, like the the signage, the scene, like how it, how it grows and getting people connected to um, the earth and um, how they can make a big difference can be a win, win, win all the way around. It seems like one of the challenges, we started this conversation talking about raking leaves. Bruce has been at it. In fact, there's a little leaf in your hair, Bruce. I don't know if you noticed. No, I'm just kidding. No, there's no. But it's like, just leaving your leaves on the lawn can be up, appear as irresponsible for if you're next door to someone who's who's out there blowing leaves every five minutes. So how do you? I have to say, I I 
drove by someone who was out on the lawn using one of those sucker uppers, you know, and he, I just had to kind of laugh. He was getting every single leaf. It looked like somebody had already, uh, like it looked like my lawn when I rake my leaves and there's still some here and there, he was going after every single one. And I was just like, yeah, I mean, you know, just not wanting to miss any leaf at all. So it was interesting. Well, that's what people think is the right thing to do. But like, I don't know, like this book right here is phenomenal. I don't know if I'm doing it right, but like um, the nature of oaks and how many species just oak leaves support. Um, you know, and again, going back to how people want to, um, you know, that they love pollinators and, and how important those leaves are. Um, and I can't speak intelligently, perhaps um, Paige or Bill or Leroy or somebody can speak more intelligently and I can about like what are on all of those leaves that help make that, um, you know, important to, for the ecosystem, you know, so, um, you know, just the educational piece in that itself will make a, can maybe make a big difference because you can see caught, you know, cause and effect. And what's really nice about this book is he takes it through all the seasons and why it's really important, all the species that um, the, the oaks support. We've come up with a plethora of options here today. Um, excited to uh, move this um, conversation forward and see what evolves in this coming year. If anybody's interested in being involved with our wetland education committee, um, let me know. Uh, again, Kendra has been on that and Courtney and Emma group of folks. What else questions or ideas do people want to talk about today? We've got another 32 minutes. No, 23 minutes. I'll just say like, so I just did a quick Google of like leaving leaves on grass. Like that's all I typed into Google. And the very first thing that comes up is a turf website from Minnesota that says excessive leaf matter is bad for several reasons. And it's just like a great example of how I feel like as environmentally minded people and people who are part of other organizations, it's important that we get our websites properly working so that we're at the top of Google instead of turf websites. Anyway, that's just my, my two cents. As my, well, that's a really I, I also- good point. Yeah, I also saw yesterday someone vacuuming. It was my, I've never seen a leaf vacuum before, but it's this little petite woman in this machine that was probably two times her size. And it was just like, it looked like a carpet cleaner. Um, but I, I think it was a vacuum for her leaves. And I almost stopped my car <laughs> and say, you don't have to do that. But yeah, she was, she was really going at it. I think maybe she was just bored. You know, I think part of part of lawn care and gardening is just someone wants to be outside. And so they find something to do when they're outside. Paige, I think that was a really good idea about getting, you know, um, you know, when you do the Google search and we get to the top, it, I think those businesses pay to be up to the top. So is there a way that we can connect with funding environmental groups, different kinds of things that have some bucks? you know, to help those websites get up there. I have no idea how any of that works, but you know, you, you have to pay to get up to the top parts with Google ads and stuff, right? Yeah, I don't know, like this doesn't look like an ad. It says, it's, oh, it says it's a featured snippet. So you maybe... still are paying to get to the top of the search. Yeah, yeah, so. There, there's been some interesting research about solar in um, proliferation in neighborhoods. And as soon as one person gets a solar system, the likelihood of more residents getting a solar system is like four or five times than a neighborhood that doesn't have one. I forget what the stat is, maybe John remembers, but um, so I think the same thing is true too with natural landscapes. You know, once you've got a resident that um, is doing it, um, so if we could, I think, highlight some of the examples 
that are already sort of popping up or ponds that have been restored or shorelines, natural shorelines, um, and then add them to the green map. I think that will just naturally also uh, be a good way to promote what we're doing. So focusing on what's working, who's doing it, and um, sharing those stories versus going on, you know, knocking on your neighbor's door and telling them they should really do something different than what they're already doing. Because I think people resist when you try to feeling like you're holier than thou or trying to convince someone to do something. There's a resistance that often happens versus just doing it. And uh, it's hard not to notice that. <clears throat> yeah, I included in the chat a link to some interesting research that Wisconsin um, Extension was part of. Um, regarding, they did a, a survey of kind of social norms regarding natural shorelines, um, and they conducted it through a survey. So there's uh, there's lots of stuff on that website about their research, but um, their messaging recommendations I think are really really interesting, um, and you know based on research. And a lot of it says you know it's outreach should really emphasize like social norms. So you know rather than like you should rake your you know, you shouldn't rake your leaves. It can be like, your neighbors are protecting their property. Are you, you know, kind of phrasing it as it's, these are normal things to do. Um, but anyway, I think you guys might find a lot of their messaging recommendations really interesting and um, applicable beyond shorelines, right? So I just wanted to make sure you saw that in the chat. Because yeah, I, I think, I, I think, I think it's think really cool work. Yeah, I think Leroy makes a good point because just yesterday, you know, I was out raking some leaves and so I was talking to the neighbor behind me and we started talking about leaves. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we also were talking, he, he has a, a Tesla and I just ordered one. So we we're talking about Teslas too. And, you know, it's kind of like two people walking dogs. They kind of stop with each other and they talk about dogs, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of like a, uh, if people are somewhat social, they're always looking for an opportunity to kind of talk to their neighbors and, uh, you know, what could be a more common interest, right, than your yard, right? And so it's, a, yeah, I think that's the most effective way to kind of actually get change if you have a friendly neighbor chat about, you know, how you manage your lawn, what you do with your leaves. Uh, I'm always somewhat frustrated because I uh, learned early that since I don't, uh, uh, I don't have a, a, a sprinkler system for my lawn that, uh, and, and I don't really, uh, you know, use the fertilizers and, you know, uh, weed killers on a regular basis that uh, you have to mow it high, right? Which is just kind of like, uh, and boy, all my neighbors are mowing it like, they want to make it like, I don't know, half an inch and like a carpet, you know, and uh, uh, so it, it's, uh, it's, it's funny how yeah, you get in certain habits. And uh, I, I guess I always kind of talk to my neighbors about the advantages of mowing high, you know, because there, there are so many advantages, but in the, in the, you know, you do it that way, the lawn looks great. You know, it, it doesn't have to look bad if you're, uh, uh, you know, doing certain kind of common sense things, if, you know, but that's, <laughs> I'd say about 80% of the leaves that drop in my yard, they actually get mulched by the mower. And uh, they'll, they'll break down a lot quicker that way. And uh, I'm like you, I, I don't use any uh, uh, fertilizers or pesticides. As a matter of fact, I'd like my lawn to go away. <laughs> I'd, I'd prefer not to mow it at all. We keep planting more trees just to take up space. But, um, uh, the amount of leaves that I do rake are going to my mulch pit so that I have some dry brown material to mix with the green stuff from our um, our garden and, and uh, household waste. So I, I'm probably the, the exception in my neighborhood, though everybody else is out there with their leaf blowers and, and, uh, and raking things up. 
Yeah, I can't talk to my mowers, to, to my neighbors about uh, leaf collection because they're all wearing uh, ear protection. <laughs> or their contractors are. These guys showed up uh, yesterday with a, a piece of machinery I've only ever seen on campus. It's a riding blower. Yeah, I, I, I thought maybe somebody was, was doing tree work or something. It was, it was the most amazing. It, it rattled the windows of the house. They had three guys with backpack mowers on and then the one guy on, on the big piece of equipment. It was just, I, I, I left. I, I, no, there's, there's no, I, don't, I, don't, I can't imagine how to engage in conversation with uh, that kind of horsepower. It, it's just, uh, uh, I feel the same way about the leaf blowers that uh, other folks feel on garbage day when you see the overflowing garbage bins and, and the empty recycling bins. It's, it's, I, I struggle to overcome the, the sense of, of, of uh, helplessness. So um, funny story. So my, my husband works for MSU for IPF. So he, he rides those like really big machines that blow all the leaves everywhere and like sweeps them up and all, all of that stuff. And he came home yesterday from work and our, there's a tree next door and I, I have not, I mowed probably like two weeks ago when he was on vacation. And um, I was waiting for the day for him to like come home and clear out all my plants because he did that last year, rake all the leaves up. And um, I caught him early. I like went out there and he just started the mower. You know, he had the blower in one hand and I, we had a nice discussion about, about leaf management and I got him just to mulch. He, so he mulched them into the <laughs> lawn, but it was so funny. I was like, he was, I mean, he was raring to go because obviously that's what they do on campus. So. But that's a great conversation. I mean, you know, a great example, right? You're married to this person, right? And you guys think differently. And, but, you know, people feel like they're doing the right thing, right? I mean, and meaning like, this is what they learned. This is what they know. You know, even like with Bill's example, right? Like whoever hired that person, that's what they think is, you know, is the, the, the right thing. And so that's where I think those demonstration areas might be really helpful, you know, um, and that kind of thing. And it's just maybe one yard at a time, having the conversations like John's talking about, Paige is talking about like, you know, and just kind of finding those, those ends at different points in time. But I think that the timing can be ripe in lots of ways, right? We've got a whole bunch of flooding, so we can talk about like buffers and, you know, how to help with, you know, native plants to help with all of that stuff. Uh, we've got this Daniel's drain thing where people are all upset about that whole thing. And, you know, people who, you know, have some native plants in their yard and trees and all that stuff, they're getting a lower assessment if I'm understanding things correctly, you know, um, although that one might be scary to walk into right now but you know th there's there's opportunities you know on lots of levels to have those kind of conversations with people and with the whole thing in mind that really people do what they know they, they do what they know and they feel like that's the if they're doing something wrong if they're not getting all those leaves up right like or, or they're not mowing down to like you know real low I mean that's what they know well, and not to put your husband out of work, but I mean, wouldn't it be cool to encourage places like MSU to think of think of it differently and that they don't need to pick it up? Or again, not to put him out of work, but just Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, thought the same thing. I thought just think about like campus as a whole. I mean, they do a lot of great, really great green infrastructure work for Well, sure. and that's what I think is interesting. They do, but then it's like it maybe if they learned about this, maybe they wouldn't do that so much 